Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to see so many of you have joined us here today. I'm Shannon Leem uh, from Aegis Therapies, and I'm the National Clinical Director on the clinical side for home health services. But today, we're going to be talking about exploring the impact of culturally aware intervention. And with this talk today, I've got some really great speakers who are going to uh, to fill in some gaps that, that we might have towards the end here. So um, you're going to be listening to me here in the beginning. Again, I'm Shannon Lean for Aegis Therapies. I'm a speech therapist by background. I live in the state of Florida. And then we're going to have Al Kamara, who's an OT, James Kahindi, a PT, and Sunit, who's also a PT. And all three are clinical practice specialists here with us at Aegis Therapies. And we are going to all be talking today about how how having an awareness of the cultural elements that display themselves within our patient population and even within our own practice, how being aware of that can have a positive impact on your uh, patient assessments, the interventions certainly that you provide, and then ultimately in the outcomes that we hope to achieve. So without any further delay, let's get started with the disclaimers that we have here today. All four of us here at Aegis Therapies, we are employed and we receive a salary and we don't have any other financial or non-financial disclosures. As you all have maybe noticed here in the, in the call, all the lines are on mute. If you have any questions, uh, please use the chat feature, which should be towards the bottom of your uh, list of options there in your banner um, for any questions. It can be related to uh, what's what we're talking about? Future um, future uh, topics that we might you might find interesting, etc. So please use the chat box for that. The other element I do want to talk about because this is a remote. Uh, you all are coming into a webinar here. You're dialing in or videoing in, um, and you didn't register outright for the course. If somebody you're sitting with registered and you're sitting with them watching this, and you hope to. Uh, obtain continuing education for this particular course, please have your name be entered into the chat box with your um, email so we can make sure that we have record of you being present and that you're here uh, so you can uh, obtain uh, credit for the course today, whatever credit that might be, okay? Uh, additionally, in the handout section, you'll see three handouts. There's the ASHA bubble sheet for those of you who are SLPs on the call and you want ASHA credit for being here, the ASHA bubble sheet is there and we'll talk about what to do that with that at the end of the course today. Uh, there also is the uh, brochure for today's course as well as the handout, the PowerPoint presentation, the slides that we have here is also present there as a handout in the handout section. Okay, so by the end of today, so in an hour, a, a fun-filled hour, we hope that you guys will understand all the different ways that we communicate. Um, we're going to outline different cultural elements that are important to consider when providing therapy services and care to individuals. And then we're going to outline the social determinants of health, which have uh, risen to the top a lot lately within uh, the inpatient environment, the post-acute environment, home health, etc. Uh, and talk about the, their impact on assessment intervention and your discharge planning. All right, but first let's set the stage. Let's, let's see, who are we talking about? If we're all here in the United States, here are our demographics. So we have some really current statistics, right? We had our, our census done. So this is as of 2021. There were 328 million people residing here in the United States with women outnumbering men women at 50.8% of the population, and men at 42.9% of the population. And then we're gonna break that down even further. Um, so more specifically, 76.3% uh, of the individuals in the United States represent uh, themselves as white. Then we have the Hispanic and Latino population at 18.5%. Black or African-American come in at 13.4%. Asian at 5.9, and folks who state there are two or more races that comprise their race is 2.8%. Uh, we have uh, American Indian or Alaska Native 1.3, Pacific Islander is 0.2%. We have 13.6% of people indicating they were foreign born. 21.6% of folks say they speak a language other than English here in the home. 
individuals with disabilities under the age of 65 are 8.6 percent and 10 percent claim that they live in poverty here within the United States or are calculated to live uh, in poverty. So as you can see, we've got uh, quite a wide swath of what we've got uh, presenting themselves here in the United States. So as they come in for therapy services, we want to be able to be aware of uh, either their expressly stated cultural elements or be observant of any cultural elements that might present themselves. So how does this happen? So, so to dig into conversation about cultural elements today in our therapy services, it starts with communication and the ways in which we communicate with others. So the first one, you know, the four general categories, uh, five if we break reading and writing into separate categories, but generally we're gonna use four here in our talk today. The first is verbal expression, which is one way in which we express ourselves and it encompasses our language content and our vocabulary elements, right? The word choices that we have, the grammar that we use, uh, the word, word play. The next is auditory comprehension or the way in which we interpret what we hear in that conversation. We may hear the words and the grammar, but the way that it's said, the tone of voice that it's said in, we might interpret that uh, in many different ways. The next is nonverbal communication or gestures or body language. Um, I used to joke that my mother could speak a thousand words with just a single look that she could give. Um, so what we don't say sometimes says things louder than what we do say. And then we have uh, the written communication or, or, or written expression and reading comprehension and how we interpret what is written. So that's the foundation of the communication elements that we're going to talk about. But we're going to dive a lot into the nonverbal elements, the nonverbal body language gesture pieces. And within that, um, the, the, the focus of those nonverbal elements, this is um, Brendan Anglin in 2015 wrote an excellent article and it's in the resources section uh, of your handout, uh, goes into the communication elements that are bound in cultural origins. And these are all very nonverbal elements. Um, so I think this is a great article. So I encourage you guys to take a look at it. In the article, he states, there are four elements that perhaps we're not aware of that affect our communication with other people and are completely cultural in their origin. And they are oculesics, proxemics, kinetics, and haptics. So we're gonna look through them one by one here. So the oculesics or the eye gaze, Anglin sums this up as, are you looking at me? That's the great way that he puts how to determine what this section means. And in some cultures, uh, it outlines how long it's acceptable for someone to look another person directly in the eye. In some East Asian or African cultures, it's common for subordinates not to make direct eye contact with their superiors. However, here in the US, it might be a bit dodgy <laughs> or you might be seen as dishonest uh, or lack some integrity if you don't maintain eye contact for long periods of time uh, or look somebody in the eye with whom you're communicating. So it's important to recognize how eye gaze might play a role in uh, when you're assessing the patient. Then there's the proxemic or your personal space, how close you stand with someone while talking and communicating. In some cultures, they seek a healthy distance between the communicators. They appreciate uh, the space between you, the personal space in, in the communicators. Um, if you don't examine the impact of your space, you may ascribe feelings of being rebuffed or physically intimidating, depending on how close you're standing to some, because in some cultures, they want to stand much closer. It, it's a sign of respect being close to somebody who's speaking, as in you're giving to them your full attention. And in others, they wanna give uh, further space. I believe it was Denmark where they say they like to have that very big space between you and speaking. So if you don't understand that element of what they're deriving or what they ascribe to that space, you might feel like they have no interest in your conversation, they're standing too far away, or wow, they're really close. Or in the Seinfeld episode where they're talking about being a close talker, they come in very close. That might be seen as a little unusual as well. But if it's bound in cultural elements, it tends to make a little more sense sometimes. 
The next is kin, uh, kinesics or your body movements. And I think we've all heard of those folks who use their hands to talk. I'm doing it here on camera with everybody who's either watching or not watching me. Um, or others who offer very little body movement into their communication. And it can be dictated by your cultural background. I think we've heard of um, some stereotypes like Italians like to talk a lot with their hands. Um, so it kind of depends. So again, how much you move your body during communication might be seen as mature or immature or respectful or engaging. You have to know where that's coming from. And lastly is haptics or touching. Anglin in this section states, it's one thing to stand close to someone while speaking, but it's quite another thing entirely to touch them while speaking. And there's some cultures where it's welcomed to touch, shake hands, hug, or even kiss. Uh, when greeting someone's, uh, someone and in other cultures, it, that would be very limited and that would not be welcome to have that amount of touching. Uh, and knowing we in the therapy profession do a lot of touching, you might want to know ahead of time how open the patient is to touching, e even in during communication or during your therapy session. Um, you know, I think we've met some of those patients who don't quite know what to do if you're touching them and talking to them at the same time, and that sometimes we ascribe that to, cult, to um, cognitive elements, so that can play a role in it, cognition as well, but culturally, how much do they welcome a lot of touching in an interaction? So I did, uh, through this course, I wanted to make sure that all three disciplines, the three major discipline organizations, APTA, AOTA, and ASHA, I wanted to go into each one of their sites and see what's available for you guys uh, from a cultural standpoint, cultural inc inclusivity, diversity, um, your competence in understanding your role in cultural awareness. So with APTA, they do have a section on their cultural competence. I gave a screenshot here. You have links that are available uh, to you guys as well. So in these sections that you'll see here, I just gave a quick snapshot of what were some of the first titles of some resources that were available here. You'll find some tools to help your cultural competence by engaging in such activities as developing a process for your own self-assessment, developing or implementing policies for your team. If you're looking to be uh, uh, aware of that from a policy standpoint, APTA will support or show you some resources for that and conducting or participating in training or professional development activities and promoting a safe forum for discussion. So in this section, the in, in many of these articles, APTA mentions that in this section, individuals and families make different choices based on cultural forces. So a lot of times we talk about um, compliance or the patient's ability to follow through on whatever our recommendations are. So if we take ownership in recognizing that some patients in their cultural background uh, might make different choices based on what we recommend, if we know that up front and we recognize that element is at play, we can, we can take steps to uh, mitigate a negative impact from that and help change or modify our instructions to be more culturally, culturally sensitive to that particular patient and their needs. Additionally, APTA goes on to say that practice is driven in the service delivery system by culturally preferred choices, not by culturally blind or culturally free interventions. So we don't want to be culturally agnostic necessarily, but we want to be aware, aware of what would be welcomed by the patient when we're making these recommendations and having that conversation up front. A little later on in the slide deck, we're going to talk about how you set up your evaluation to be able to get some of that information. Um, additionally, APTA goes on to say that inherent and in co cross-cultural interactions, there are dynamics that must be acknowledged, adjusted to, and accepted. So APTA going uh, into great lengths to have uh, cultural elements be observed. Here we see the AOTA resources uh, for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and they incorporate different approaches for OT practice, research, and education. In this um, section, and it was, uh, it's not listed in your, in your resources because it came out since I put the slide deck together, but in April, um, there's a great article on implicit bias in OT practice where the article goes through that internal review of what you might be 
unknowingly bringing to the table from an assessment standpoint, from an analysis standpoint. Um, it's uh, issue number four, volume eight, the April edition. Um, and it's available in the website uh, for members to go in and read. So I really encourage you to go and take a look at that article. It was uh, really well thought out. But many of the same resources here with AOTA that you might see on the APTA side, how to be more culturally sensitive, be aware, have your self-reflection checklist, et cetera. Let me go to ASHA. ASHA has a practice portal, for those of you who are familiar with the ASHA website. Um, and in this, there are many resources that can support cultural responsiveness, uh, goes through some of the social determinants of health, um, and your own cultural competence checklist. So let me show you a quick, quick snapshot. Um, oh, we'll go with the snapshot in a second. My apologies. What, what Asha outlines as what is culturally responsive, I thought was a great, um, discussion point here. So responsiveness, uh, cultural responsiveness involves the understanding and the appropriately and appropriately including and responding to the combination of cultural variables and the full range of dimensions of diversity that an individual brings to the to interactions. Cultural responsiveness requires valuing diversity, seeking to further cultural knowledge and working towards the creation of community spaces and workspaces where diversity is valued. Asha then goes on to explain what cultural competence is, which is a dynamic and complex process requiring ongoing self-assessment, continuous cultural education, openness to others' values and beliefs, and willingness to share one's own values and beliefs. This is a process that evolves over time. It begins with understanding one's own culture, continues through reciprocal interactions with interventions with, interve with individuals from various cultures, and extends through one's own lifelong learning. So it 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 sets the stage for recognizing that this is a continuum. That there is once you absorb these elements, it doesn't end there. You are continually seeking to know and understand and be aware of all the cultural differences that you might run into. And the last one, cultural humil humility, refers to the understanding that, one's own, uh, that one must begin with a personal examination of one's own beliefs and cultural identities to better understand the beliefs and cultural identities of others. Again, cultural humility is a lifelong process of self-reflection. So with that, ASHA has on their website, um, in that vein of, personal humility and, and personal examination, uh, they have their cultural competence checklist. So I put a quick screenshot here of a portion of that, that question. It asks many questions to heighten your awareness of how you view clients or patients from culturally, linguistic, or, or culturally or linguistically diverse populations. And in this, you're to rate yourself one through five with one being strongly agree, you strongly agree with the sentiment of the question or the statement in this checklist, or five, you strongly disagree <clears throat> with the sentiment that's outlined in the questions. Um, so some examples of the questions you see here are, I accept my client's decisions as to the degree to which they choose to acculturate into the dominant culture. So are they assimilating into what the culture is within the environment we're in, or do they keep and hold dear the culturals, the cultural elements from where they came, and they hold those closer? Um, so being aware of what your impression is of that, whatever direction the patient's going, is what you would rate one through five. Um, I provide services to clients who are LGBTQ. Um, so one through five. I do not impose my beliefs and value systems on my clients, their family members, or their faith. So there's many other questions here that are examples uh, that you wanna look at for self-reflection. There's no answer key. However, it's recommended on this form that you regularly, regularly review those statements that you give a three, four, or five response to and make a determination how that might um, affect assessments or the interventions you provide to your patients. So here we're gonna get into the social determinants of health. So they can be grouped into five domains, uh, economic stability, education and access to quality, meaning the educational services, 
healthcare access and equality or and quality, neighborhood and uh, the building environment, the built environment around them, what's the status of that, and their social and community context. Being keenly aware of those elements during your assessment and throughout your treatment will allow for a more inclusive and robust outcome for follow-up and for the care. So these social determinants of health are becoming more included in our comprehensive assessments in our post-acute environments. For example, in the OASIS, <clears throat> on the home health side of things, there's a question, B1300, uh, health literacy, where this is a new item that was introduced this year in 2023 in the newest version of OASIS. And it asks how often the patient needs someone to help them read instructions, pamphlets, or other written material from their doctor or their pharmacy. And the, and the possible answers, answers range from never to always. Um, and includes options for the patient of not being, uh, of not being capable of answering the question <clears throat> or refusing to answer. Knowing the response of this question will give you insight into how you plan your interventions, how your goals might develop, and how your transition to a discharge might change depending on what the response is to this question, uh, or how and how you might put develop uh, put together a plan that'll mitigate this uh, potential lower element of of uh, health literacy for the patient. And I believe in 2023 here, October of 2023. Uh, there are social determinants of health questions that are going to be showing up in the MDS as well. So this concept <clears throat> of how the environment of the patient, the socioeconomic elements, the health literacy, the impact of their education, et cetera, their access to health care, how that impacts um, their uh, the services that they receive, the outcomes that they achieve, et cetera. So it'd be really interesting as the years go on, as this data is um, uh, accumulated, what the results of that information might show us. So knowing the social determinants of health, these are some of the elements that you're going to want to take into consideration for that transition planning for the next environment. Uh, you're gonna use social determinants of health for the follow-up care and services for the patient. Knowing um, how the patient understands their own disability, how they, how they interact with healthcare, what their home environment is like, What's their access to food or if they have any food insecurity, how that plays into your discharge planning, um, nutritional status, et cetera. Their social circle, what's their support that they might have available in the home environment? And then whether there's safety, housing, or other environmental considerations. Sometimes we learn about that as, we, as we're um, further into the treatment plan, and it's incumbent upon us, I think, to learn about these elements at the time of the assessment or as close to the start of your care with the patient as possible so that you have time to account for them in your intervention and your goals. All right, so I did think this was also important to bring up um, to determine whether what we are observing with a patient is a difference or if it's a disorder, right? Distinguishing between communication differences potentially uh, and communication disorders uh, involves the ability to be uh, aware that cultural dimensions and individual variations may influence the patient's eye gaze, uh, may affect facial expression and how they uh, hold their, their, um, their facial expressions with you in conversation. We talked a lot about body language and how um, is this a disorder that we see happening or is it part of their cultural and it's just a difference between you and me. Rules of social interaction. We talk a lot about turn taking on the speech side and pragmatics and being aware of how conversations happen, but in different cultures, conversations happen in a different way. They may have a different flow. They may have a different cadence um, to the conversation and being aware that that might have be having an impact on the interaction will tell you whether this is a difference or a disorder. Perceptions on mental health. Um, we know that in some of our uh, comprehensive assessments, we've got the PQ, uh, PQH2 or PQH9, which goes through uh, depression screening and whether or not the patient would be open to answering those questions truthfully or feeling that there is a stigma on addressing any elements of mental health. So recognizing that might have a, a role in it is important. Um, 
rules of social interaction. We talked about that child rearing differences. If we treat pediatric patients, it's important to understand child rearing differences from the cultural impact, physical health, their illness and disability and how they perceive that. And then patterns of superior and subordinate roles in relation to age, gender, uh, gender identity and class. I think many times, I think we've had interactions with patients, especially when I was much younger <laughs> and you'd be working with somebody that's many years my senior, sometimes they don't have that um, confidence in a much younger, this is not the case any longer, <laughs> they may not have the confidence in a younger person in, in a healthcare relationship element. So that might be playing a role culturally with that particular person. So understanding that might go a long way to uh, having the conversation with the patient. So reviewing cultural and linguistic variables and factors that may influence communication to determine if the communication patterns of an individual may be related to their cultural background or is it considered a disorder. Also recognizing that regional, social, or cultural or ethnic variations of a communication system is rule-based and should not be considered a disorder of speech or language. So you wouldn't um, necessarily work with a patient, if we're gonna talk about speech on the speech side, who has a Castilian accent on, from Spain, who has a very frontal lisp sound. That would be cultural. You wouldn't want to do speech therapy to affect a change in that frontal pronunciation of the S sound, because in their culture, that's the appropriate dialect and that's the appropriate way to say and speak and the position to hold their mouth. But here in the US, we might see it as a disorder. But when we recognize that's culturally appropriate, that's not considered a disorder any longer. It's a difference and you would not have it be classified as a disorder of speech or language. So uh, going into the, the, the steps here, the final steps of recognizing how we provide our services to a patient and how we want to be open to be accepting of cultural uh, differences, as well as opening an opportunity for them to explain to us any cultural differences we need to have for our interventions. We have to make sure that the environment is set up in an inviting way, that the environment is accessible, that we have a modification of the schedule if needed for any cultural or individual values, um, appropriate and culturally sensitive materials used during our assessment and intervention activities, I know on the speech side, uh, some of our older speech tests have some very uh, unique pictures or uh, ways of describing things that we would not use today because they have a different um, they have a different spin to them now, or they have a different impact when you say them or use them. So we might look for a more updated version of those testings, and then individual perceptions of the assessment, possible diagnosis and intervention strategies. Uh, we want to make sure we are open to changing those for uh, the patient should we need to. Other elements of the assessment uh, consideration is ethnographic interviewing, which encourages the interviewee to provide information they feel is relevant rather than respond to question uh, questions posed by the clinician. So question, answer, question, answer sometimes isn't very open. Uh, we want to make sure that we uh, use open-ended questions rather than just yes, no restating what has been said by repeating the exact words rather than repeating, uh, rather than paraphrasing or interpreting what we think was said, uh, summarizing statements and providing the opportunity for correction in case of misinterpretation, avoiding multiple questions posed in rapid succession or multi-part questions <clears throat> can sometimes lead to misunderstandings, avoid leading questions that tend to direct the person to a specific response, and avoid using why questions because such questions may sound judgmental and may increase defensiveness. Um, I try to change the word why. If I'm looking for a, a reason as to what's happening with the patient or why they chose to do one thing as opposed to another, instead of using the word why, if you change it to how come, how come this was done, how come you 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 modified what we needed you to do or how come we get, didn't get around to whatever the situation is. So how come has a different softer tone to it than why. So that's just a, a potential for you all to use from that standpoint. 
So what we're gonna do now, we're gonna open up to the three other fabulous speakers that I've got joining me here today. We're gonna listen to some interview individuals and learn about their cultural elements and how it impacts their therapy intervention. And we're gonna start off with James Kahindi, who is a clinical practice specialist here with Aegis Therapies. So welcome James and take it away. Thank you very much, Shannon. Uh, as Shannon mentioned, my name is James Kahindi. Uh, I'm a clinical practice uh, specialist with Aegis Therapies. Uh, I've been with Aegis now for a little over 20 years. Um, I came to, to this country, you know, uh, in such a criminal pasture, I would say. Now, I'm from Nigeria originally. Uh, that's where I got my Bachelor of Physical Therapy degree. Are we Nigerians, we think, we think that Nigeria is the giant of Africa. Of course we are, because it's about, you know, 200 million people that lives there. And, you know, anywhere you go to in the world, you're always going to find a Nigerian there. And now, over my many years of working in the United States, I've actually worked in multiple settings, from home care, to long long term care setting hospitals and uh, you know even school system so I've had experience of experiencing everything that the United States basically have to offer when it comes to physical therapy and interaction with patient. Now over my many years of practice though, uh, I've been able to and I continue to see opportunity for providers, therapists included, to be more culturally aware of their patient uh, in, in the way they approach them in the treatment that, you know, that select for those patients and what type of intervention that they are providing to those patients. And much more importantly, you know, the follow-up recommendation that they are making, you know, to, to be able to have them to be compliant with whatever they're trying to, to, to provide. So now, um, as part of this presentation, we're kind of thinking about how should I direct it? So I kind of like look into three main aspects that I want to, bring to your attention this afternoon uh, that may be something that you take home to be able to understand people that are from my culture. The first area is, is respect. You see, in my culture, respect is very, very important. Uh, you know, when you are in front of an elder or somebody in position of authority, we are thought not to look directly into them in the eye. If we do that, you're actually disrespecting them. So, so it is common for you, you know, when a patient might come to you, you see them looking away from you or they're looking down when you're speaking to them. You, you know, here in the United States, we might think, oh, maybe they are hiding something. Maybe they are being shy. Or maybe they are not able to, uh, to focus, you know, they lack focus. That is not the case. It's just a sign of respect. And I want to make sure that you, you, when you are making your recommendation and intervention for those patients, you don't give unnecessary recommendation or referrals for them. I make sure you know services are provided accordingly. So that the area of respect is very big, you know, when it comes to, to, to the way we are brought up and the way we you know, in our culture. The other area is honoring somebody. You see, you know, um, when I first got to the United States, it was a little bit of a challenge to when I was working in a nursing home to be able to call somebody that is in their 90s or 80s or even 70s at that time by their first name, you know, that would be considered as being dishonor. You're not respecting, you know, that person. So we want to make sure, you know, so, so in the process, if you have a patient that comes to you, you know, an elderly person that you're working with, uh, you know, you are constantly addressing them by, by their first name, that would be considered as being rude, condescending, and actually might say that you are belittling them. So, you, you, so, so the whole idea is that they may actually refuse to work with you or request for another therapist to work with them just because of the way that they perceive how you are interacting you know, with them. So, so that, that's a very, a very important aspect that you want to know, have in mind when we're working with you know, patient people from my, from my country. Uh, the, the third aspect of it has to do with community. You know, we, we, we have this thing that we, we kind of work together we are a team, you know, it takes, it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, and the process, you know, we give time to everybody. If somebody comes for us, you know, for an advice or whatever, we're always gonna give, you know, give our time to it. So, assuming I have an appointment at your clinic at 4 p.m., as far as we are concerned, time is relative. 
time is not rigid or it's not specific. So we say, okay, yeah, my appointment is 4 p.m. Well, maybe I'm trying to leave my house at three o'clock in the afternoon. And one of my friends or my family member showed up and they want to have a conversation with me. I wouldn't even think about it twice before I, you know, give them 15 minutes of my time. I have that conversation with them because it's just what we do. So now, um, if I show up at your clinic at 4.15, in my whole mind, I'm right on time. But you might be saying, oh, this person is being late for the appointment or, or, they, or, you know, or, or they don't respect your time or they lack time management skill. That is not true. It's just because of my culture and that is what I do. That is the way I'm supposed to give time to anybody that I, you know, that, that or my friends or my family. That is valuable to me. So if I find you saying that to me, that I'm, you know, I lack adequate time management or, or, or you know, I'm always late for my appointment. I'm going to take. I'm going to be very offended about that. I think I want to be careful about how we work with those kind of situation uh, in my culture. So um, I just want to, you know, in conclusion, I want to make sure that it is important for therapist or any kind of provider to be culturally aware of their patient in order to improve patient compliance, patient experience, and patient outcome. So thank you. Thank you, James. All right, so now we're gonna move on to Alka. Alka Mera is also uh, a clinical practice specialist here with Aegis Therapy, she's an OT, so welcome Alka. Well, thank you very much and welcome to all the participants um, who are on this call. Um, like Shannon said, my name is Alka. Um, I'm an um, OT by background, clinical practice specialist with Aegis. Um, I grew up in Delhi, India. And I did all my schooling, including occupational therapy school in India. And I migrated to United States in 1995. Um, I, I moved into Minnesota and I've been living in Minnesota and to my family's um, displeasure and, and kind of like, you know, questioning my choices as to why I would move to a place which is so cold and full of snow coming from Delhi, India, where they had never seen, I had never seen snow in my life. It's been a transition and it's been a journey. So when we talk about journey, I'm just gonna talk about that component from an occupational therapy perspective, because honestly, it is, it is a journey. Um, even when we work with our patients, when they go through an episode of illness, um, a fracture, any kind of an inflammation, it is a journey for them to start from point A and then try to get back to that point, you know, a point of their prior level of function through a variety of things. And it, I personally feel like it is my job to provide them with the best possible care, keeping in mind what their preferences are. As an occupational therapist, occupational profile is something I always take into consideration. And if you look at the AOTA um, recent you know, definition as of 2020, it describes occupation profile as client's personal group or population, occupational history and experiences, patterns of daily living, interest, values, needs, and relevant context. So what Shannon had gone through her presentation, I think all those elements fit into what my experience has been as an occupational therapist, truly considering, you know, what is it that my client likes, what their prior occupation was, what kind of an environment they lived in. Because again, each culture has different values, different beliefs, different way they function, the more I know about the prior level and what kind of things they prefer and how they like to go about those things, it allows me to provide that patient-driven care and make sure that I'm being respectful and honoring their wishes. You know, just like James was talking about a different opinion in even having that eye contact, or for me personally, that therapeutic touch we as clinicians are always reaching out, gently touching or providing that, you know, closeness, trying to establish that rapport with the patient. But I need to be very cognizant of certain culture where touch is not really welcome to the same degree. So just kind of making myself aware of what the cultural preferences are, how people kind of perceive that touch, 
that allows me to connect at a level that I feel like my patient, my client would be more receptive to what I have to offer and how they can progress in the goals they have in front of them. Having said that, you know, what I think would be um, something that might resonate with my patient may not necessarily be the case. So truly talking to the client, the family, um, looking at the environmental preferences so I can truly guide my treatment that way. I'm just gonna, you know, just share an experience with all of you. There was a time when one of my fellow OTs were working um, with a per person of Indian descent, and then she was trying to teach that person how to dress, you know, put put a like a dress, almost like a gown or a muhu on. And then, you know, she felt like the goals are met, I can kind of move on. And the husband came over and said, you know, can you teach my wife to wear a sari, which is a natural, you know, kind of like a, a dress or a garb that every Indian person would be wearing. So this was kind of like something my, you know, fellow OT shared with me. It's like, oh my gosh, I did not even know how this person dresses. And I've been trying to teach her just to put on a dress or take off a dress, which was not relevant or did not mean anything to this person. So having said that, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion is the buzzword right now. And we all have to be very aware of the cultural preferences and how we can move on with those preferences and provide the best optimal care to our patients. With that, I will hand it back over to you, Shannon. Thanks, Alka. And a great example of um, sort of getting into your groove of an assessment and maybe not recognizing that, you know, you're thinking this is what they want to wear and how they want to wear it. And the family speaks up or the patient might speak up and say, hey, I'd like to wear something else. Right. So in this case, it has a cultural impact, but in many other ways, it could be just uh, something else from regular run-of-the-mill jeans and a t-shirt they might want to wear. That's their normal clothing they want to wear. So as opposed to what can they get into in the moment. Awesome. Thanks, Alka. All right. So now we're going to move over to Sunit. That's our last speaker. Sunit, last but not least, uh, he's also a clinical practice specialist here with Aegis Therapies. Welcome, Sunit. Thank you, Shannon. I feel like James and Alka, they took all my talking points, so I might be very limited here in what I can share. Uh, well, like Shannon said, uh, my name is Sunit Kapoor, uh, clinical practice specialist with Aegis. Uh, I'm a physical therapist by background. Uh, I first moved to United States uh, close to 16 years ago. Uh, I did part of my training for physical therapy back in India uh, and, and some part of it back here in the United States. So. Uh, it's been an interesting journey uh, so far. Uh, I still remember one thing when I moved to United States, uh, I was having the most challenge with was spoken English. Even though I grew up in India and I, I, I spoke English as a kid, I studied in school and I was very fluent with it. There were a lot of slangs, there were a lot of words which I just could not understand. <laughs> and a lot of time I have to I have to go back and ask like, okay, what do you mean by that? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the word. Or I have to go in and Google it on my phone uh, if, if, if it was some uh, if it was something I just could not ask. So, and I see that similar pattern with our patients. A lot of time we just assume they hey, they speak English, so they probably understand what I'm trying to explain and educate them on. And sometimes they might be just shy and not ask, and they just might not understand. So I think it's important to just not have those preconceived notion, but actually break it down and ask those questions. Um, especially when you are working with somebody uh, from India or Indian subcontinent, uh, I think nonverbal gestures are, are, are a key that you can utilize to understand if they are actually understanding your education and, and, and your plan of care. A lot of time you will see them using a lot of hand and their head movement. A head movement right to right to left may mean a yes, it may also mean no. So it's important to understand that it's it's probably not the same across the board, across different countries and cultures. So just trying to get yourself familiar with those, those nonverbal gestures uh, is probably another key to understand how you can help your clients, your patients better. Um, 
And one of the topic that James was mentioning, uh, typically uh, similar to many culture, I guess in Indian culture as well, uh, we place elders at a really high respect. So they will typically be the leader of the family and they will receive a lot of respect and love within their family. They are used to making decisions. So when you are actually devising your plan of care or creating a plan for them, it's very important and they are, they are involved in it because if they are not, then it's highly unlikely that they will participate and follow through with your plan of care. So uh, getting their feedback, trying to engage them in the process is probably the key uh, to improve their participation and get better outcomes um, uh, with them. <clears throat> um, another good point to remember is, um, a lot of different culture um, may have different elements. And as a physical therapist, uh, typically I'm talking about doing exercises or giving them a home exercise program. Uh, when we are talking about somebody from India, they're all very familiar with yoga. Uh, somebody who is probably in an older age or an older adult probably would be practicing that within their home. That's just a part of the cultural norm. So utilizing that, that, that knowledge they have of that and, 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 and utilizing that and adding that to your treatment plan will actually help you to get better outcomes and results with them uh, in those ends. Uh, so that's all I had from my end, Shannon. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the call. Thank you, Sunid. And you, you reminded me of talking about the communication side of things. You mentioned you had a lot of trouble following along sometimes with what we're saying uh, and that misinterpretation that can come as a result of it. So um, we didn't talk about uh, the language barriers that might exist, right? We um, didn't talk, go into the concept of interpreters or anything like that. Knowing uh, if you're in a facility or you work in home health, there is a level of interpretation that might be needed um, and your facility should be able to provide to you the connection through which you can get interpreter services. I know sometimes we rely on family members to be our interpreter and sometimes if the interpreter has skin in the game, <laughs> like a family member, they may not interpret what you say the way we want them to. So sometimes having a third party who has no vested interest in either the assessor or the, uh, the client uh, can yield a better result in what's being said and how it's being said. So uh, I'm not minimizing the impact of having a family member be an interpreter, but sometimes it's better to have uh, a third party assist with that. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, I so appreciate the three of you joining me here today to go through that. I, I never cease to learn so much from all three of you, so I appreciate that. Um, the other element that I, we didn't really touch a lot on, and I did see in the in the uh, in some of the questions in the in the chat, somebody was talking about religion and having religion and that cultural element uh, be part of what's occurring in the therapy session. And uh, and it either lives loudly, you may have some religion elements that are playing loudly in the patient's intervention, and to be aware of that, or some that are on the more diminished side, but still uh, important nonetheless. So again, learning what's an ADL to the patient, daily praying or daily prayers for a patient and having whatever role that plays for you as a, as a, in a physical sense, from a mobility sense, to be able to pray if they're very, uh, there's a mobile aspect a physical aspect to the prayer versus speaking in on the speech side. That might be fairly important. Um, additionally, having uh, religion may be showing itself in the items that you use for therapy services. Um, and I say this because I, as a speech therapist, sometimes my go-to is a deck of cards. There's so many things that from a speech standpoint, I can do with a deck of cards. I see a deck of cards as non-confrontational. It's not a speech activity, right? It's a, the, their mind, their cognition is not coming out. I'm not asking a bunch of questions. It, I, I think it's, a, it's a, an innocuous task. I view it as an innocuous task and that's my implicit bias. But it was brought out to me with a patient when I brought out a deck of cards, she got very upset with me because they were, uh, that, was a, that was of the devil, that I was not to be using that. And it immediately brought it into show, sharp focus for me that I had assumed this was a, a very innocuous thing to use and everybody would, would appreciate this. So it made me be very aware to ask the question, uh, would you be willing or using with a family, would you be willing if I used a deck of cards uh, with this? So 
bringing into sharp uh, focus for me as a clinician, recognizing that uh, as my own implicit bias that I did completely dismissed it as something that would be welcomed by anybody in my in my interventions. I, uh, I think we're getting close to the end here. So I do wanna put up some housekeeping slides so that we can finish up with some questions that I do see in the chat. If you're requesting ASHA credit, so there's a lot of questions about the forms and what to fill out, et cetera. The only form anybody needs to fill out um, uh, from a CEU perspective is the, uh, from an ASHA side of things, the speech therapist, that in the handout section of your banner, there are three things there one of which is the ASHA participant form, and that you do need to download if you're a speech therapist and you're searching for, uh, you're requesting ASHA CEUs, you need to download that particular form, fill it out with the uh, elements that are needed, your name, your license, your ASHA number, et cetera, your state, your license in, et cetera. And you're gonna submit that back to Shyla. Uh, oh, it should be, I apologize. There's a, a typo in the in her name. It's not Shyla at Hamrick at Aegis. It's Shyla.hamrick at AegisTherapies.com. <clears throat> so there's, there's a dot there at that first at sign. My apologies for the typo. And you're gonna return that to her. You can scan it and email it. Um, if you can't scan it and email it, you want to send it uh, as a text message, email Shyla. We can figure out a way to get it from you uh, in that way. So there's where there's a will, there's a way. We'll get your ASHA bubble sheet by hook or by crook. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a survey <clears throat> that we ask all of you to fill out. It helps us improve what it is that we do here. Uh, it has suggested topics that we are, we really do look at those and we are looking to uh, expand our topics um, and, and would look for any of those suggestions that you have in there that would be very helpful. So there is a survey that will launch at the conclusion of this and it'll also come in an email. So if you don't see it when you close your event here, or when the event ends, if you don't see the survey, it will come in a follow-up email for you and we ask that you click on that link and then go to that survey. Um, everything else is a passive CEU process. For, for Aegis, we, from the AOTA side of things, we have your name, we have your registration and your discipline. For the PT side of things, this course has been approved in Florida and I believe in California. Um, most other states uh, out there have a reciprocal process, or Minnesota I think is another one we have it approved for. They have a, 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 a process through which that if any other state approves it, they'll approve it in that state, so Florida. Um, so if you're in Colorado uh, and it says Denver or Colorado will accept from any other state, Florida, we have it approved through Florida, so Colorado will accept it. Does that make sense? So that's how you uh, achieve the PT side of things. You will keep the brochure and your certificate, which will come in an email following this course. We ask for your patients to send out all the certificates. There are right now 321 people in this call today. So it takes a minute to get all those generated and emailed out. So that is the final housekeeping elements. Here are the resources. These are in your handout um, that you can use uh, for your own education and, and, and learning and self-reflection or for uh, further information for your own um, for your own lifelong learning that we've talked a lot about here today. All right, so let me go to the questions that are over here. I did see a couple of really great questions. One question was about referring to a patient by their, uh, the question is, if we refer to a patient by their last name, is it a HIPAA violation, like in the gym? And so she goes on to mention she feels strange calling older patients by their, their name. I'm suspecting maybe their first name. Um, I always ask, I'm a speech therapist, I ask them, that's, you know, your name is very personal, right? And how you address them. I always start very formally, Mr. or Mrs. Smith. Um, and then I ask, is, how would you like me to address you? And some say, oh, that's fine. You can keep doing that. Or you can call me Bob. Um, and I always make a note of it. Um, I used to mention it in my evaluation because it was a way it certainly was an assessment element. I asked a question, it was personal. They gave me a response so they understood what I was saying. So from a speech therapist, they gave me information, but also reinforced what I was going to do from then on out, how I would refer to that patient. So I always defer to them. How do you want me to call you? What, what would you like me to call you? 
um, and go from there. I don't think you can go wrong with that. Um, as far as saying their name in a crowded gym, I don't think that's a HIPAA violation, especially if it's a patient who lives in the facility. They're there. These are other residents of the facility. You wouldn't want to shout their name and, and say that their treatment session is going to begin with so-and-so to work on this, that, and the other. But I don't think saying their name is, uh, is necessarily a HIPAA violation. Um, of course, you want to, when you do have those uh, uh, discussions with a patient, you want to have them in a quiet space so that you can have that interaction with the patient that's not overheard by anybody else. So with any of that, um, any demographic information, sensitive medical information, all that, you want to make sure your voice is low or you're in a space where uh, they, you can't be overheard. Um, there's also a question. Um, I saw one. I apologize here. Let me see if I can scroll to it without closing the box, which I have. Shannon, as you're <laughs> sure. as you're going through that, I was just gonna share about the first or the last name. I I think that's a great question. Sometimes when people prefer to be called by a certain name, but whether it's a term of endearment or um, like a shortened name that they have, it's good to pass it around you know, through the multidisciplinary team. So everybody addresses and aware of that. And it, it is well documented that way too, that not only we have patients consent, but this is what they are asking us to refer them to. Perfect. There is a question uh, that states, or, or sort of a description, it says, in my facility, we had a patient who was assigned male gender at birth that had changed names and transitioned to female. I believe there'd been hormone therapy, but not any surgery to change the body parts. It's my understanding that we need to ask a trans person what they want to be called uh, as their pronouns, and I'm sure there are more specific things to know. Absolutely, that's a really good question and very, very topical these days. Um, asking what their pronouns might be. If you have, it, if it is a question, um, then certainly you'd want to know so that we are being appropriate to them. Um, ASHA, I believe, I'm certain APTA and AOTA have it addressed as well, So, and, but I didn't look these up, so I, I'm only speaking to an assumption with those two organizations. I know ASHA specifically has uh, a lot of things on the gender affirming elements uh, in their, in the assessments especially on the speech side of things, right? We do a lot of work from a voice perspective for that, that uh, for the trans population where they're going from female to male where the voice needs to come down or male to female where you try to raise the voice register. So that concept has been around for quite a bit on the ASHA side of things. So I think that might be another place if you wanted to look up um, something from that perspective, if that needed, to, if that was a goal to work on, ASHO certainly would do that. But I agree, yes, you wanna make sure that you're as respectful as possible to uh, have the patient be uh, addressed in the way in which they wish to be addressed with as much respect and dignity as possible. Um, I think that's, I don't think I see any more questions. Catherine, am I missing any? Um, a recording of the session on the Aegis side, the session is recorded. So if you are an Aegis um, employee, they are available to be watched again in the uh, clinical field resources folder in our SharePoint. There is a folder called Impact with Aegis and in there is a recording and it has the handouts and the brochures and stuff uh, available there if you are an Aegis employee. If you are not an Aegis employee, there is, I don't believe at this time, we have a place that we're putting any recordings for these, uh, but that might be in the future. You might see something on the ASHA website where there'll be these recordings. So uh, Catherine can- uh, Shannon, the uh, recording will go out in the email to- Oh, that's correct. To everybody. My apologies. That's, I'm so glad I've got other people who know more than me. Uh, the recording, the link to the recording will be in the, the email, but there's no CEUs with the recording. So certainly you're getting the CEUs through this. And I say that only for folks who are not on the call who get the recording as a non-participant there's no CEUs available to that. So if you forward it to somebody who wasn't here, they can't get CEUs for the recording, if that makes sense the way I said that. And then Shannon, I think just maybe a little bit more clarification around the CEU credits. It looks like there's some questions out there about, is it is it automatic? Um, I know you covered that, but maybe just one more time so people understand sure. exactly how that works. Um, for the OT side of things, it is automatic. For the for PT, it is state specific. So each state, and there are probably 
maybe all of the states represented here today. Uh, it is state specific how you will achieve and obtain your own CE credit. So we give you the certificate, which shows what states it was approved for. So like I said, Florida, Minnesota, I think California is also approved for it. It'll be on the certificate. You'll have the brochure. So you want to download the brochure from the handouts and have that as a PT. Uh, and that will be your method to submit, if that's the way you do it in your state, that this was uh, part of your uh, teachings for the year. For ASHA, we take the step, once you submit to us the ASHA participant form, we submit your name with all your information to ASHA, and then it will show up on your ASHA transcript. I would usually give about 45 days, I think is the uh, time at which it might take ASHA to get it on the transcript. We do it pretty quickly. We have a quick turnaround on our end, but ASHA, I, I believe it's a 45 day wait. So if you're a speech therapist, go ahead and at about that uh, end of June mark, go ahead and check your ASHA transcript to ensure that you were there. If um, nothing shows up and you don't see it there, go back to Shyla's email, which we will go back to here, shyla.hamrick at aegistherapies.com and ask her and, and we can help follow up uh, for on the ASHA side of things if we need to, we've gone to bat for that. And AOTA side, I believe we, since we have your name and your registration, uh, all of those elements and your certificate, same thing, you're gonna want your certificate and your brochure, but the uh, AOTA side of things, it's a little more automatic because we are an approved provider. I so thank everybody for joining me here today, all over 300 of you. It's been a distinct pleasure talking to you and I hope you all have a great rest of your evening and good night. Thank you.